Thanks uh, for coming to our first uh, Lunch and Learn of the, the semester. Um, sorry it was kind of a late uh, invitation, but um, James uh, was you know, gracious enough to, to do this for us. So uh, James is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, his research focuses on human computer interaction and medical information delivery. He received his MS and PhD in computer science uh, from Keeley University in the UK. Uh, and then prior to doing his degrees, he worked uh, in various roles at Apple, uh, specifically in leadership and technical areas, such as working on hardware, consumer behavior analysis, and other technologies. He has a background in systems and software engineering, mobile application development, and user-centered research studies. He predominantly focuses on delivering uh, mobile clinical decision support tools. Um, all that to say, uh, it's going to be a really cool seminar. I'm, I'm glad uh, we got him, and uh, hand it over to you, James. Marvelous. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then bring this little screen. So um, the reason I called it technology, humans and healthcare is because that's pretty much sums up my research in a whole. Um, but effectively, uh, I thought I would give you um, an overview of um, sort of user set and design and uh, human computer interaction in terms of the research that I do. Um, and hopefully along the way, you'll learn a few things not just about what I do, um, but about sort of user centered design and, and uh, human computer interaction at the same time. So um, I thought for anyone that doesn't know me, uh, I know Zach's just given a, a brief introduction, but I thought I would uh, give you a, a slight introduction about who I am um, and what I do. Um, so here goes, uh, I, I went to the Cheshire School of Art and Design in England uh, and then to Manchester Metropolitan University and did a degree in uh, photography of all things. Um, but what that did is lead me to getting a job at Apple, uh, initially in the retail system, um, because I was, I was always interested in computers. So this is my first ever computer, the uh, Amiga 500. I'm going to show my age now. Um, I also had a, an Apple II. Um, and uh, for anyone who remembers these things, uh, a Nintendo Entertainment System. So although I had a sort of art and design background, I was always very interested in, in computers. Um, and I was very lucky as a, as a child. Um, to be able to basically um, have access to them. So um, I started off in Apple retail. Um, I initially started off training people um, in sort of photography applications. Um, and then I became uh, what they call a, a genius and a lead genius. Um, but what that did is it led to uh, me uh, joining uh, the, what they call the corporate side of Apple um, and leading teams, uh, doing software testing uh, and, and user analysis. Uh, in terms of how people access um, Apple systems. Uh, we mainly did the, the the sort of software side in terms of Apple retail, because uh, that's where my experience was. Um, but basically, uh, I got to have a, a nice sort of broad experience with lots of different software applications and systems in, in a big company like Apple. Um, I then went back to university, like Zach said, did my master's and PhD and postdoc at Keele University uh, in computer science, uh, mainly looking at how to deliver uh, clinical information uh, in an acute hospital setting. Um, so now I do human computer interaction and user -centered design for mobile application development and software and systems engineering in healthcare. So for those of that of you that don't know, um, I'm I'm going to go through but very very briefly briefly what HCI and UCD is. Um, so I won't read these out, but basically HCI is a study of how people interact with computers or how to build computers so that they're interactable uh, in terms of uh, humans using them. Uh, usability is a little bit different. It, it looks at different attributes in terms of how people access the systems. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, this tends to focus on user interfaces. It's not always like that. Um, and I, at the end, I'll give you some resources that you can access uh, in terms of different things. But for me, usability is pretty much how something is designed uh, for the purpose that it's intended. Um, this is kind of like a, a 101 overview um, from uh, Jacob Nielsen. Um, this is part of what you call the Nielsen Norman Group or the NN Group. Uh, and there'll be a link at the end of this for you to go and have a look if you want. It's a great resource for lots of things in terms of human computer interaction and usability. Um, and it, it covers everything um, from, uh, you know, how to run focus groups and, and things like that as well. But there's lots of advice and help on there. But uh, this just explains usability in terms of, uh, looking at things like learnability, is it efficient? Can people remember how to use the system? Does it introduce any errors? Uh, you know, you can imagine in a medical environment, introducing errors, you know, can have some catastrophic 
um, ramifications. Uh, and then the main one is is whether people are satisfied using it, because ultimately you could spend months, if not years, building a system. People won't be satisfied using it and won't use it, and therefore it'll just sit there and never get used. So they're the, they're the two, but why are they important? Um, there's there's a, a few different reasons, but I'll give you some examples. Uh, so does anyone uh, remember this? This this was an emergency alert that people in Hawaii received on their mobile phones, uh, basically telling them to seek immediate shelter um, because of a ballistic missile threat. And the whole island got this. And the reason they got this was because of a usability issue. The system that they were accessing um, basically had just blank uh, HTML links uh, in terms of plain HTML link, sorry, uh, in terms of um, um, sort of testing the system. The one at the top is the actual alert, and the one further down is the drill, the one that was meant to just be going to one internal device. And instead what happened was the user at the time clicked the top link uh, and everyone received this threat to their mobile device. And I think it took about two hours to fix, just because basically... Uh, some of the, you know, the, there was no sort of uh, interface design or anything around it. It was literally two separate links. Um, there are other things as well in terms of um, why this field has become more prominent more recently. Um, if you think about how people access computers, uh, people would probably have a, a terminal like this uh, where they do things like spreadsheets and stuff on. Um, now we have a huge amount of different devices that we access lots of different pieces of information on, on a daily basis. Um, these aren't mine, by the way. I'm I'm not that bad. Um, but ultimately, um, the, the the sort of focus now is becoming how users interact with uh, devices, um, uh, multimodal devices, to access similar information. So if you think designing a website, for example, um, you've not just got to consider the 16-inch MacBook Pro and the 14-inch MacBook Pro. You've got to consider iPads of varying ages and screen sizes, phones of varying ages and screen sizes and other devices that people may access them on as well. And that might just be for a website, but then for apps, uh, banking systems, uh, there's lots of different aspects. And there's lots of different things that you have to take into account when you're designing for a larger screen in comparison to a small screen. And I'll give you some examples later on. Um, another example might be that, you know, people would sit at a desk and access this, you know, this, this technology. Whereas now, uh, you know, you have a lot of information just on your wrist. Um, and ultimately, um, the, the idea of accessing this information uh, has become more ubiquitous in terms of how we get access to it. Um, and there's lots of other things to consider as well. So why is usability harder than you think? I'll give you some examples um, of how people uh, tend to behave uh, in terms of accessing systems. So there's something called apparent versus inherent usability. Now, uh, um, Karasu and uh, Akashimura um, basically... Uh, did uh, several studies, but the, the most prominent study um, was around this apparent versus inherent usability. And it makes it very difficult in terms of getting feedback from users. Unfortunately, uh, this basically means that if, if people perceive something is usable, then they'll probably tell you that it is, even though it isn't. Um, and, and in this case, uh, what they did was they had a system that looked pretty and a system that, that basically had a function. Um, and the system that looked pretty didn't function very well. Uh, and then the functional system that didn't look pretty functioned to, to complete a task. Uh, and most users um, basically um, scored the, the one that looked pretty better in terms of usability than the one that didn't, even though actually it wasn't actually usable. Uh, another example um, is that people, uh, this is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, but the less ability people have to do something in terms of you know, accessing a system or, or utilizing a tool, um, the more perceived ability they have. So they might tell you that they can do something in a particular type of way when actually their actual ability is really poor. And then when you get further down the line, when people actually have the ability to do something, that's when the imposter syndrome kicks in and they say, well, actually, no, you know, I, I'm not able to do that or I'm not very good at doing that, even though actually they're probably an expert or almost an expert at doing that. Uh, and there's lots of other things as well. Um, you know, people, for example, like similar psychological profiles to their machines uh, that they have. Um, and then this is one that we coined a few years ago called optimism. Um, you get this a lot in healthcare, um, basically where people are very optimistic about an app or a software system that is being implemented, uh, mainly because it is much better 
than what is available already. And you get this a lot in healthcare, um, mainly because it takes so long to get system changes. Um, but what will, what normally happens is um, you 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 give them an app to use, and they say it's you know it's the what we call the best thing since sliced bread. It's it's absolutely fantastic. It's a it's a really really great uh, system to use. When actually it's probably got a load of issues, but it's better or or it's newer or it's something that they're optimistic about. So they'll be really positive about it, and it makes it very difficult to get um, you know sort of negative feedback and things and uh, constructive feedback in terms of of um, developing a system. Uh, so there's there's some of the things that you need to look out for anyway. So. Um, one of my areas of research is looking at uh, delivering clinical guidelines. Um, and basically, um, I did this for about five or six years. I still do it now. Um, but basically, there's there's lots of different things that you need to take into account when, when developing uh, clinical guideline systems. Uh, the problem that I had with my research, and this is stuff that I did for my PhD and my postdoc, um, was that a lot of the things focus on you know, a lot of the apps that 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 were being made focused on things like navigational design. So they'd have really great menu systems, and then the end at the end result would just display a PDF. There was no actual design on the guidelines themselves. Um, they rarely implement well-known heuristics for design. They'd normally just follow sort of a tool and give you a menu or whatever it might be. Um, but also, uh, they they tend to fail to involve the users. So they build a system, they spend like six months or a year doing it, and then they get feedback instead of going through feedback in the different stages of design. And the example that I'll show you shortly um, is how, uh, with the research that we did, we involved users throughout and then the outcomes of that as well. Um, there's other things that a lot of um, research uh, in this field don't tend to consider. And that is one that there's going to be multiple users. You can't just say somebody is a doctor or a nurse because there's lots of different things that you need to take into consideration. For example, you've got very knowledge, varying knowledge and expertise, not just in the information that you're delivering, but the tools that they're utilizing as well. So I'll give you some examples of the research that I've done. Um, and then, by the way, if anyone has any questions at any of the stages, feel free um, to pop your hand up. I might not be able to see them. I think the hand will pop up, but if not, I'm sure somebody will... Uh, highlight that to me. So um, so these are, are standard clinical guidelines that you get in the UK. Um, they're, these are called bedside clinical guidelines, and they're designed, um, basically, they, they, they've been going for about 25 years now. Um, they're in about 56 um, hospital trusts across the UK. And they're designed, basically, um, to um, reduce the amount of information that a clinician needs. Uh, in terms of treating the patient uh, quickly and efficiently um, in an acute hospital setting. So rather than going on the, the NICE guidelines, uh, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence guidelines, um, they, they utilize these so that they can uh, gather information <laughs> within that particular hospital uh, quicker than they would from going through, say, you know, 300 guidelines, um, you know, on the, on the NICE, on the NICE system. Uh, Ian has a question. Shoot, shoot. I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I can tell from the lower right because it's handwritten, but are these actually carried around by clinicians like in the stuffed in their pocket or in a book or is this projected on an EH? Oh, good God. <laughs> okay. so, uh, at this, I mean, like, so they had these things. They used So in the UK, um, they, they, got, they used to carry them around in their white coats. Uh, and then someone at some point decided um, that doctors shouldn't wear white coats anymore in the UK because it was impersonal uh, and they we should be referred to as their first name and not doctor. Um, and therefore, then they, these things started getting chained to nursing stations, uh, mainly because they kept getting stolen. So um, <laughs> basically, they would have these books chained to nurses stations. Uh, eventually, um, over the last sort of uh, before I started working on the project, so probably 10 years ago now, they started moving to PDFs and books. Right. But you can imagine when they're utilizing these books, if they need to make an update, they used to have to go around with stickers and stick the stickers in the books so that the clinicians could access them. Right. But yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. But yeah, they used to run around with these books basically to help them. So this 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 is an example of a medical guidelines book. Um, I think this one's from like 2009. They get updated biannually. Uh, unless there's something a bit more pressing in terms of accessing it, in which case they will uh, they will adapt the PDF and stick stickers in the books. Now they're using my app, so <laughs> problem solved. 
but yeah, they would they would literally run around the wards with these books, uh, or mainly use them at, at sort of uh, you know sort of computer stations or whatever it might be. So, right. well, appreciate it, mate. Thanks. No, that's okay. <laughs> Um, so the, these books basically contain lots of different things from, you know, manual nomograms to, uh, you know, sort of uh, pathway tools to decision algorithms to images to, to basically show uh, clinicians how to, you know, uh, um, um, give an EpiPen, for example. Um, so we basically took this work and me not, not having a clinical background started at the beginning. So I went and did observations. Um, and that's where I learned how clinicians access technology very differently in terms of whether they're, you know, a senior clinician, for example, or a junior clinician. So as an example, uh, a junior clinician will use it for, for, for knowledge gaining purposes. They will access lots and lots of information. Uh, they will read more, uh, whereas a senior clinician may um, use it for knowledge affirmation. So they might remember the particular type of drug and maybe around about the right dosage, but they just want to check that the, the, the dosage is correct. So then they would access this information uh, and very quickly check, yep, it's 3.2 milligrams over the next 24 hours or whatever it might be. Um, so that was doing observations. We then did a survey um, and then we utilized current design recommendations um, to basically build a really quick and simple, or what we call in computer science, quick and dirty prototype uh, that we then took uh, into uh, things like focus groups and system usability scales uh, testing. So what we did is we ran focus groups, um, which basically uh, we we demoed the app to the clinicians. Um, we then asked them to to feedback. It was very difficult to be honest. Um, focus groups of clinicians are are, um, in my opinion, and and a lot of other people's opinions, horrendously difficult for a few different reasons. But the main reason is because uh, it's very difficult to get eight or 10 clinicians in a room at the same time um, and get feedback on. And what we were doing with these was basically tagging on to um, like pharmaceutical presentations within the hospital. So this pharmaceutical company would come in to talk about a new drug that they had. Um, and we would tag on at the end of that for 25 or 30 minutes and try and run a focus group. And it became very difficult because uh, you, you tend to get a lot of dominant individuals within those groups. Um, which means that the conversation can be screwed one way or another. Um, and it became very difficult to, to get to gather the feedback that we wanted. So then you can see um, after the second on the second focus group, we actually adapted um, focus groups um, in a different way, which I'll talk about a bit later because it's another thing that I'm going to discuss. Um, but we adapted the focus groups. We did these things as well called system usability scales. And it's a set of 10 questions um, by a chap called Brooks, who used to work for IBM. Um, and basically, these 10 questions are a really good baseline in terms of getting a, what you call a usability score. Um, it's not massively perfect, um, but it's, again, a quick and dirty method of getting usability feedback about a system. Uh, and then when you make adaptions to that system, you can then utilize that as a baseline to see whether or not the usability scores um, increase. But it's important you can see that we've made adaptions to this app. And we've constantly gone through the same cycle of focus groups and feedback. And, um, and it's important um, because it, at the end, instead of, instead of building something and then showing people, you're building part of it and then showing them and getting feedback and building another part of it. You're iterating through that design process. And that's important because then when it is implemented, it causes minimal disruption to the workflow, which increases the chances of it being integrated um, and utilize far more. So Nick, you have a question, shoot. I sure do. Uh, is there, how do you prevent the feedback that's, this is fine, but, and then they tell you what the final product should look like? I, I would think I, if, you, if I were to present, go ahead, go ahead. Right, I was gonna say, so um, the, the way that uh, we did it um, was rather than presenting them the final product, we would present part of the solution to them. Um, so, for example, the, the decision algorithms that we looked at here, um, we had an issue with these, obviously, because on a mobile device, they didn't really fit very well. Um, so we would get feedback from clinicians by designing part of the app. So you can see the first prototype here. We'd then get feedback on that, that smaller section of the app, not the whole finished solution, just one part. And then we'd iterate. Okay, how do you through. avoid, how well, do you avoid, if you go back to prototype version one? Yeah. Like, I would think a lot of the feedback would be, it's missing this, it's missing this, it's missing this. 
Yeah. Is that what you got? Yeah, you do. And you do, you do get, you know, what I think things like, you know, have you considered this or why isn't this in there and things like that. And I think that's just part of the feedback cycle. And this is one of the issues that we were having within the focus groups um, was that um, um, basically, you know, clinicians were saying, well, you know, have you even considered this? And actually that would be further down within the examples that we were giving or whatever it might be. Uh, one way that we tried to focus on this is just to get, ask them to provide feedback just on what they see, not what they don't. So rather than saying, can we just, you know, can we get feedback on how you think the system looks or how you, you'd be a bit more specific in terms of, do you think you could utilize this, um, you know, as an example um, for, for, for this particular, this is acute myocardial infarction uh, management. Um, do you think you could utilize this for acute MI uh, management? Because then it's a bit more specific in terms of, and then you can kind of shut down anything that's a bit more broader. Well, you know, does it have this in it? Well, we're not concentrating on that at the moment. We're just concentrating on how this in particular is displayed as an example of how it might be utilized within the app and not, not as a whole solution for everything that we've ever thought of. Because that's one thing that you do get. Um, one of the issues that we were having within the early focus groups was that people were talking about ethics a lot and how the app's going to be implemented and whether it's going to be, you know, CE marked or or and things like that. And, and actually these weren't even things that we were even considering at the time um, in terms of, uh, implementing, uh, we needed a solution first, and then when we were going to be implementing, then we'd look at things like you know um, testing ethics and um, you know the the sort of um, in terms of um, you know delivering it in a mobile app, whether we could get a CE mark or not. So, um, but these are the four prototypes that we had, and you can see at each stage we've involved the users, we've asked the questions, we've done system usability scales. And then eventually you end up with something that that well now is utilized and uh, has very good feedback in terms of of how it presents the same information that they had in the books effectively. Does that answer your question, Nick, or have I gone around? around oh no, the, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah, great, great. So um, so yeah, so we designed this this prototype version of a flowchart, which is a bit more programmatic. Um, and then we had an app. Um, that basically we we implement with 157 guidelines, um, clinical guidelines, medical guidelines um, that we basically utilized. We came up with a big set of recommendations uh, in terms of building apps like this. Uh, and then we took that app and we tested it um, with medical students, um, 38 uh, participants. We did uh, think aloud sessions. Um, now, think aloud sessions are basically where you will get a user to utilize an app. Um, and you'll get them to maybe complete a task. So in this case, um, we had what you call uh, 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 clinical decision-making scenarios, where we would give them some clinical information written by a, um, a lead respiratory consultant. Um, and then the, the students would then work through that uh, to try and answer the, the questions that it might be. So it might be like, you know, if a patient has this issue, you know, what guideline would you go to? What information do you need? And how do you get them to you know, what kind of treatment do they do, do they require for that particular issue? Um, and then basically you would you would throughout the, the 15 minute session, um, ask them to explain what they're doing at all stages. And if they can uh, try and give feedback in terms of um, what they're doing and what they think of it. So it might be, for example, that they're scrolling through and they might say something like, well, I don't like how much scrolling I have to do. I would prefer if it was all condensed and I could use a search. Um, so then you start to get lots of different bits of feedback uh, in terms of how they're actually uh, utilizing an app or a system um, in a way that then while they're actually utilizing it, it's a bit counterintuitive um, and you kind of have to talk them through it before they start. Um, but then we audio recorded and screen recorded um, and we were able to look back at that and see things like um, whether that induced any errors. Um, and we looked at that as well. But uh, for example, uh, this is one of the findings that we had. Um, the uh, one of the early feedback things in terms of the system itself um, was that the um, join the focus groups, it was mentioned that they wanted to see the whole flow chart. They wanted that gestalt view of the whole decision tree. Um, but when we actually did testing, uh, most of the participants actually utilized the programmatic version. And what we found through, through further testing um, and in the hospital is that uh, when they're using it for um, clinical purposes, when they're actually trying to make a decision, they use the programmatic version. When they're trying to learn, 
um you know it might be after they've uh, treated the patient they want to go back through and have a look at you know the the, the sort of wider decision tree then they utilize the programmatic version uh, the the um the gestalt version the, the flow chart version of it um other things, for example, where we put filters in there, we were able to see whether whether um, users utilize things like filters, um, both within the actual um, menu system uh, and in the guideline itself, it has a little tool that highlights uh, particular words so that if they're looking for something, they can filter out the sections of the guideline. Um, we looked at comments, whether they were negative or positive. So this is something else that you can do. You can code comments, and, and I imagine some people have done it already. You can code comments to see whether they were positive or negative and what they were referring to in terms of the system. And then you can have a look at whether people perceive that positively or negatively. And then that will enable you then potentially to recognize any issues within that system as well. So you can see on here, uh, the third one in, which is warnings and alerts. Um, we actually figured there was a problem with the warning and alert system, and we found that out after um, without anyone even mentioning it uh, and it was that they were skipping it and weren't seeing it um, and we looked at the comments and what they said about that um, and that was that was one of the findings is that we realized afterwards that there were negative sort of connotations towards the warnings and alerts uh, and we went back and redesigned those um, this is the sus score between the first and second prototype so the way the sus the system usability scale works is there's a, a positive and then a negative question um, and there is research to suggest to make them all positive, and there is a method to doing that as well. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, we can discuss it further. But basically, you can see you should have a, an increased score and a decreased score between each question. Uh, so, for example, question one is positive. So what you should see from the first and second prototype, if you've implemented the findings correctly um, in terms of things like feedback and focus groups, you should then have an increased score. And then when with the subsequent questions, like two and four, you should see a decrease. And you can see from involving users throughout, we've either increased or decreased those, um, those scores, which means that we've made a more usable system in terms of the system usability score. And that, that just gives you, as I said, a quick and dirty method of saying that's feedback. There's lots of other things that you need to look into. So for example, errors. Um, we looked at errors uh, induced, at whether it was an information retrieval issue uh, in terms of whether they were missing information. Uh, so one of one of those was that um, they were skipping the warnings. Um, they were looking for a particular piece of text uh, within there to tell them to do an echocardiogram, and they didn't see it within the warnings because they were they were looking in the main text, and they assumed that that information would be in the main text. So what we did was actually implement whatever was in the warnings within the main text as well. It was repeated within there. Um, just so that if they did miss it in the warning, it was in the main text too. It didn't need to be inferred from reading a longer sentence or whatever it might be. Um, we looked at things like whether there's any bug issues or app issues. Um, so a usability issue that we found, for example, is a very quick, we go back to the app here. You'll see where um, in, in the, um, there's the main title there, indications, and then a subtitle there that says interactions. Um, at one point, some people thought that was a button to act, uh, to activate uh, a tool, and it wasn't. They were tapping it, and uh, so we realized that was a usability issue, and nobody even mentioned it. They just carried on going, and so that was one of the screen recordings that we we utilized as well. So you can see we've gone through all of these stages, um, basically just to to make a, a final prototype. Um, we've we've designed and iterated, got feedback, um, had a baseline in terms of a system usability scale. We've then done the same thing again. And again, and we've gone through. Um, now what we're doing is um, one of the things that we, we realized very quickly is that, like I said earlier with the junior and senior clinicians, how they actually access that information um, is, is different. So what we figured out, especially looking at, we did a, I mentioned earlier, we did a, um, a survey. Um, I don't think it's in this one here, but we did a survey um, and we, we asked what apps clinicians use on a daily basis. We had this list of about, I think it was about 90 apps in the one hospital that clinicians utilized. And what we realized is there was no perfect solution. People utilize different tools because it fits within their, you know, their, their sort of personalized needs. And it was the same for accessing the guidelines and how they utilize the information as well. So now what we're looking at doing is basically getting use data and structure uh, and user analysis. I think there is, um, is there a question in the chat at this point? Cause I can't get access to it, so. Somebody says variations in care are frequent. Hmm. 
Yeah, and I think well, this is what one of the clinical guidelines were aimed to address um, in the UK, especially. Um, you might go to one hospital um, and they might use a completely different set of drugs than from another hospital. And then obviously the, there's a difference in terms of how they access it and things like that as well. So is there more in the chat there, Nick? I think there's three now, isn't there? It says frequently variations are not necessary. Frequently they are harmful. Okay. Is that all of them or because there's three, I think? Yeah. Uh, those, yeah. Marvelous. Right. So, um, yeah, so basically looking at um, uh, sort of personalized views, um, utilizing. So there's a researcher in uh, um, University of uh, Southern California, um, uh, Kai Zeng, who basically found that when you build um, a personalized system, clinicians don't want to spend the time going through and adapt, you know, changing all the settings so that basically they can have a system that's personalized for them. So we're looking at making it automatic, at least for clinical guideline delivery. Um, and you, you get this in real life too. So for example, Netflix do this all the time. Uh, there isn't just one poster for Stranger Things. There's a nine or 15 or whatever it is altogether. Uh, and it's based on user behavior. So for example, um, if you've been watching a load of, of uh, Uma Thurman films, um, then Pulp Fiction will display a, a poster for Pulp, um, uh, Netflix will display a Pulp Fiction poster with Uma Thurman in. And if you've been watching loads of John Travolta films, it'll do the same film, but with John Travolta on. Um, and you get this quite a lot uh, in a lot of different um, systems that you'll probably utilize on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and we're looking at doing that um, for uh, clinical guidelines. So you might have like how, how a junior clinician accesses the information in comparison to a senior clinician. You can look at adapting the order of the guideline or how quickly a, a user can get to particular sections based on their on their previous behavior. So that that's an example of how we've gone through user set of design, uh, utilizing lots of different things like focus groups and think alouds and system usability scales to adapt a system uh, and find that actually it needs to be adapted even more to support a more personalized approach. So does, I've got two other things that I'm going to discuss throughout, but has anyone got any questions at this point before I move on to the next part of the presentation? Yeah, sorry, I, this is Jim Barry. I'm actually a physician who's on. Hello. Thanks for the great work that you're doing in this area. And I keep screwing up when I chat in, but the app that you developed is great. We actually have something similar called Clinical Pathways at the University of Colorado that we're using. Yeah. And it does a few more things for at least the, the clinicians. It also helps write orders and helps develop progress notes. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I wanted to ask you about is how far kind of along the Kirk, Kirkpatrick's training model have you gotten? And that there's four levels of that when you do some kind of training intervention such as this. One is that people enjoy using it. One is they enjoy using it and they learn something from it. Then the third level to that is that they actually change what they do. And then the fourth, which everybody's always trying to get to, especially in simulation education, is does it improve an outcome? So it really seems like you're you're well on your path to kind of figuring that out. So thanks for yeah, doing what you're doing. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think the, 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 the issue that you have in terms of proving outcomes with clinical guidelines um, is that there's, it's very difficult um, with without doing what, what they saw was unethical, which would be to have this um, this sort of intervention in one ward uh, or one section of the hospital and not the other. Um, and we're still trying to work on a way to have a look at um, providing a baseline of, of outcomes for this in terms yeah. of delivery. So you could do it retrospectively and use previous outcomes from myocardial infarction. I don't, and I'm not sure if it is unethical because if if you think that what you're doing is much better than what is kind of now being practiced, then maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. But if it's unproven, which this this app may be, then it actually isn't unethical. It, it wasn't that I saw it. Yeah, it, it wasn't that I saw it as unethical. It's that the the NHS ethics board wouldn't allow us to do that. They saw it as unethical, um, mainly because I think they they saw it as a tool that could assist a clinician in in being able to treat a patient more efficiently. Uh, than what was already available. And therefore then patients could then argue that having this introduced made the care um, you know, more efficient. Therefore, that other person that didn't have that could argue then that you know, they had more efficient care uh, in the same hospital. 
uh, and may see that as unfair. So they, they didn't allow us to do that. We, we are, um, it is implemented. Um, it's 56 different hospitals and testing and things like that now. So, um, but in terms of measuring outcomes, without saying it's, you know, this department doesn't use it and this one does and having similar outcomes previously, it's very difficult to say whether it's. Um, so what we're relying on is user feedback in terms of whether the clinicians think it has assisted in terms of patient outcomes. Uh, and at the moment, it, it seems to be quite um, a positive um, sort of uh, consensus. Um, but again, you know, that could go back to the apparent versus inherent usability thing that I discussed at the beginning of this uh, and lots of other things and biases that have been introduced as well. So um, uh, we're trying to keep it in terms of just a tool um, that we can evaluate and not necessarily as a it 100 percent improves patient outcomes. So. Um, but in terms of um, integration as well now, we're, we're getting it in the med school because the clinicians that are in the med school then go into the hospital for years four and five, um, where it is uh, predominantly utilized. Um, so they'll have all the way through, not just a learning tool with far more information, but then the condensed treatment version that they'll then utilize within the hospital so that you've got that continuous flow from the fourth year of med school all the way through to the junior clinician, senior clinician stages. Uh, access in the same system so hopefully it means that it, it has a better outcomes in terms of learning and and uh, and sort of um, confidence when they're in the hospital especially for junior clinicians because this information for them you know when when it's three o'clock in the morning and they're they're on the, they're on the ward you know on the ward and they don't really want to make, wake up the, the you know the, the the sort of lead consultant or whatever it might be that gives them a tool um, that's in the pocket rather than having you know one that's been stolen from a nurse's station or I think at one point we looked at how they access the PDF and there are 11 different stages they had to go through just to access it for, for it's crazy but um and then you find them you know doing things like googling stuff to try and get access because the search engine on google was better to find the nice guideline than the nice system was um so then the hospital in the infinite wisdom shut off google so the clinicians can no longer utilize the tool. So there's just lots of different things like that, but this gives them a tool within the pocket. Um, and I think because we've involved them throughout all the stages of design and development and implementation, um, they have, um, they, they've got this invested interest now, which makes them more likely to use the tool because they were involved from the beginning, um, which is also, so they're a bit more positive in terms of uh, telling other people about it and, you know, uh, yeah, feedback and things like that and getting involved with the studies and things so it's uh it's all positive anyway but thank you okay um i'll move on to my next section now so i i mentioned um before um focus groups are very difficult but they're a really rich source of of gathering information in terms of um in terms of you know especially in terms of like app feedback um because you can you can get either condensed and things like that but there's a lot of problems with focus groups. And as I mentioned before, one of the biggest issues is trying to get 10 clinicians or eight clinicians or whatever it might be into a room uh, and basically, um, you know, getting feedback from them in, in a condensed amount of time. Uh, and then there's lots of other aspects to that as well. Like you might want to go back and, and ask them information, um, but, you know, it's a focus group. It's not necessarily, you know, a, a direct dialogue with the, the uh, participants involved. It's a dialogue between them. And then you might go away and two weeks later, analyze all the transcripts and realize you've no idea what one of them is saying or you want them to explain it a little bit more. Um, and there's no method of doing that. And one of the things that we did for focus groups was utilize something um, called idea writing. And uh, we did this for two reasons. Um, the first one was because we, we only had a very short amount of time. And as I said, you, you tend to get some dominant individuals within these groups. Uh, conversations get overtaken. Um, so therefore, we 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 utilize this method, um, which is called idea writing. And the idea is that it's almost like a silent focus group. You will put an idea at the top of the page. Um, in this case, this is just an example from a web page. Um, and people would write underneath what they thought about the idea. And then they could either comment. So that, that piece of paper would get passed around the room. And they would either comment on what the other person has put or put their own comment and it kind of builds like a, a you know, a story or, you know, you can have a conversation on a piece of paper, but what it limits is, um, is the conversation within the room itself and it going off topic. It's on that particular piece of paper. That's all that they're focusing on. And we tried this with, with, um, 
with feedback for the system. So we wrote these different ideas at the top. So we gave them all a demo device um, with the app on. Um, we give them instructions within that, how to, how to access each part. We let them access each part. And then we, they had a piece of paper on there with like, you know, we want feedback about the current main menu or what you think about the guideline layout or what you think about how the, you know, the warnings and alerts are presented. Um, and then basically we got them to write underneath, have a bit of a conversation. Uh, these are just two very simple examples that can get more complex. Uh, and on some of them, you'd end up with three or four different pages of, of uh, you know, sort of dialogue and feedback and things. Um, but it meant that you could get much richer information in, in a short amount of time. Uh, and what I'm looking at doing now is adapting this method so that it's um, to something what I call the, uh, at the moment, a working prototype, uh, the clinical participation tool. Uh, and the idea is this is just a screenshot of like um, a, a standard sort of internet forum. But the idea is that you would have an idea, the, the concept at the top, and then some instructions within there, um, within that system in, in terms of like, you know, you might want feedback about a particular part of the app. And then you can gather feedback. The facilitator can come in and ask for clarification. Um, and then users can basically converse in terms of um, accessing that. So if you imagine uh, the best way to describe it is going to be like something like Reddit, but for feedback on systems. Um, and the reason that this is good is um, it can be used synchronously or asynchronously. So um, we utilized idea writing during um, a Zoom call um, after COVID hit. Um, we couldn't get access to the hospital, so we managed to get five clinicians onto a Zoom call. Uh, and we basically got them to do the same idea writing, this thing, um, but with Google um, Google uh, Docs instead. And we ended up with similar feedback. And it was just literally one part of the app that we want feedback about. But we had this little conversation uh, going on there, and it meant that we could access it later on. It saved time on things like transcripts and, and other parts as well. But um, with this tool that um, I'm building at the moment, uh, it's looking at um, basically um, we can add time limits so you can it can be more longitudinal. So if you wanted clinicians to basically give feedback on a particular part of a tool or, or an application that you've built, um, you know, it's easier to get them involved because then they can do it asynchronously, um, which means then, you know, during a lunch break, they can go on there. They can have a look at a video of, you know, how a clinical warning is displayed within a particular app that they utilize. You can gather feedback on that and then you can prompt them for more um, clarification or thought. Um, you can have an open dialogue or a conversation um, between clinicians then. Um, it also um, means that there's um, less pressure to contribute. One of the other things that we found during focus groups was that you, you get some senior clinicians in there and then the junior clinicians would basically spend time, you know, echoing what, what a senior clinician might have said. Um, because they just want to participate, they want to contribute to the conversation, even though they're saying exactly the same thing. And with this, uh, if it was anonymized, it would mean that the pressure to contribute isn't there. They're not going to add something that isn't necessarily adding to the conversation. Uh, they're going to be thinking they're going to have more time uh, for, you know, for clarification on what they mean, more time for thought. They can have a look at something during one, you know, break. Uh, and then maybe after they finish their shift, they can have another quick look at it and give their feedback that they have. Um, but it means that there's there's uh, simpler uh, data extraction as well in terms of things like, um, you know, uh, getting the data out of you no know, need for transcripts as I put there. But then we can do automatic categorization with NLP, things like sentiment analysis within particular feedback areas as well. So that's something that I'm looking at building too. Um, I can't show you a demo of it yet because it's only half built. Um, but this is just an example of, of utilizing something simple like idea writing and turning it into a system that means that hopefully we can get more participation within clinical environments uh, asynchronously so that we can get the same feedback that we would within a focus group. Um, the final thing that I was going to go through is, is something that I did uh, during my PhD and postdoc, um, and that was working with uh, single clinical expert uh, rather than multiple clinical experts. And this has real advantages in terms of uh, systems and, and being able to prototype very quickly and I'll explain why. So uh, Nielsen, uh, I showed you the, the usability stuff at the beginning of this um, and Nielsen is is what you would class as you know the father of usability so to speak and he always says about uh, you need at least 15 users to discover all the usability problems but the, he has a law of diminishing returns uh, and when you get to about five users you normally have 80 percent 
of usability problems uh, fed back. And then the more users you add, it's then getting repetitive. Um, we built this app um, that we wanted to implement into the hospital. And we were we were pretty much ready to go in terms of pilot testing. Um, and then COVID hit. Uh, and not only did COVID hit, but COVID hit early for me um, because uh, I was working with the respiratory department at the hospital. That was my main access. All the consultants that uh, were working on the clinical guidelines project, um, all of the people that have been running that for the last 25 years were respiratory consultants. So I had a big issue because I'm getting to the end of my PhD here, uh, finishing off, starting my postdoc. Um, and I've got this, you know, no access to the hospital, very difficult to get access to any clinicians. Um, so I basically utilized a, uh, a, a one clinician um, instead of five, which is what I normally had access to. Um, and we utilized this one clinician for lots of different things. So one of the things that we did was warning classification. So we um, in, within the guidelines, they had these little black box warnings throughout. Uh, and there was loads of them. There was like for, for the guide, for, just for the medical guidelines, there was something like 380 of these warnings within like 200 and something pages of guidelines. It was a, a shocking amount of information. And we needed a way not only to categorize them, but have a look at their their sort of um, uh, usability in terms of whether, you know, did they need to be in there? Were they, were they contributing to anything or was it just, because some of the warnings are really simple. It might be, you know, it'd be like, for example, you know, a warning that said, make sure you wash your hand before you, you treat a patient. Some of them were literally like, you know, the, the, like you can see underneath the, the immediate treatment there, the generalized tonic chronic status is potentially life threatening treat without delay. So there's, there's this like sort of the categorization of warnings, a hierarchy, if you will, that we needed to implement. And it was very difficult, again, because I didn't have a clinical background. Um, so we did card sort. So this is, by the way, Lego is a great way of teaching people how to do card sorts because you can sort Lego pieces out in lots of different categories. So just as an example, um, but we basically card sorts with um, with warnings. So we looked at uh, the, the 380 warnings. We grabbed some examples out. We had the warning itself, what section and what page it was in so the clinician could access the, the PDF version and have a look at the warning within context. And then they categorized those warnings. And um, we did lots of different card sorts from whether they categorized it as high and low. They then did a second card sort for higher, intermediate, and lower risks. And you could do a structured card sort. So the first two were structured. And then the third set was unstructured. And, and uh, sorry, the third and fourth set were unstructured. And they were actually the clinician suggestions about how those cards should be sorted. Um, so you can see there's other methods as well, like structured and un unstructured card sorts that you can utilize to be able to categorize information that you're delivering. Um, the clinician then took the 380 warnings away and then did this really complex categorization because he realized that not only is the stuff within the boxes, you know, uh, you know, it's the, the is, is it likely to happen, but is it also severe? Uh, but then each one needed to things like, is it something, um, you know, you can see here each warning box needs to be whether it's a likely, you know, is, is there a likelihood? What's the severity? Uh, is it an event that they're trying to avoid? But then you've got things like, you know, for example, is it just a referral to another department? Uh, is it just telling you not to utilize that guideline? Um, is it an order of an action thing? Is it, you know, things like, for example, uh, dosages in a particular thing? Is it, there's, there's lots of different things, but basically, ultimately, what it meant is we could utilize one clinician um, instead of five or six and wasting the, the time and, and the, the sort of precious access to them to basically tell us that these things were way more complex than we originally thought. Um, so we basically utilized the clinician just to, to categorize them into two different categories, which is what we did in, in the first card sort. Um, and then we utilized the same clinician um, to basically look at um, if there's another type of warning that we could have. And, and in this case, this is the, the stop hand warning that we utilized um, for, for example, making sure that they're in the correct guideline. Um, because there was an issue with um, maintenance, uh, fluid um, maintenance guidelines where they might have been in the incorrect one and they needed to make sure they followed the original adult fluid management guideline first um, because there was about six different guidelines they needed to util utilize depending on the patient uh, that they had. Um, we then managed to uh, reduce the number of warnings with that single clinician. And these were tested afterwards um, and obviously, you know, affirmed, but um, 
we managed to reduce the number of warnings. So we took these 46 guidelines, for example, that had 130 warnings and reduced them to 28 uh, warnings because we realized a lot of the warnings weren't necessary. I think over the years of these guidelines being edited and changed, more and more warnings appeared. Um, so almost going back through and re-editing them again and working with them. Uh, other benefits that we had with working with a single clinician, um, we managed to reduce the text in the guidelines because we had a single person to go back and forward to in terms of getting feedback. Um, we reduced the number of tables, which is really um, beneficial in terms of mobile devices because tables aren't good in mobile devices. Uh, we were able to test all of our decision algorithms very quickly. Um, uh, we were able to verify information uh, very quickly. Um, discussion of workflow, if we had any questions about workflow, we could just go to one clinician. Um, and it meant that when we were then going to the later stages and doing things like the focus groups and the think alouds, all of these really simple things um, were, were able to sort of mitigate um, very quickly without having to worry about um, you know, getting all the fee, all this feedback from a focus group and then implementing it and having to do another focus group again subsequently. subsequently. So, um, but as you can see, like the, the, you know, I put there most importantly, adapting the clinical information. Um, when we were looking at rewording things, it meant we had an individual to go back into from um, to be able to test these things out. Uh, just finally, um, I've got some resources here for you to, to sort of have a look at if anyone's interested in further reading or whatever this the Design of Everyday Things is an absolutely fantastic book by Don Norman. Uh, Don Norman um, worked at Apple, um, and I think he did the, the, um, um, the Design Lab uh, at the University of California. Um, and basically, he, uh, he he discusses everything from, you know, faucets to toilet seats to, but it just, it, it goes through in a way that makes you realize that how much of the things that you utilize on a daily basis are designed in a particular way, and what happens when they're not designed, you know, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, the NN group websites, this is a Neil, if you just Google NN group, it's a Nielsen Norman group. Uh, and it, this is Nielsen, the usability uh, guy and Norman who, who wrote this book. Um, this is a good book. A uh, hundred things every designer needs to know about people. It's just quick psychology, psychology sort of aspects in terms of how people behave, uh, especially when it comes to designing things that they're going to be utilizing. Uh, if you want to know more about usability and user experience design, um, the Laws of UX is a really amazing uh, web page. Uh, it's beautifully designed, but it goes through over the sort of uh, more simple aspects of usability. If you want to listen to something in the car or on the way home, the Use of Defenders podcast is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's, it's done by a guy called Jason Ogle, who actually lives in Colorado Springs. Um, and it's a really great resource. Lots of different interviews with lots of different types of people in terms of uh, them building software uh, and systems for people to utilize. And the other one is the HCI book. Uh, Alan Dix is pretty much the uh, the father of um, sort of modern human computer interaction. And the HCI book, I think it's on his fourth edition now and he's working on his fifth. Um, he's a very eccentric individual um, and it's worth looking into him as well. But it's it's a very good book uh, to give you a good overview in terms of of, of different aspects of HCI. Um, hopefully, I've given you uh, enough examples um, of my work and not bored you too much, and given you an idea of uh, of you know what it means to work on systems to make them usable and things like that. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Now that I've waffled for nearly an hour. You're getting applause. I don't see any questions, though. Um, uh, I have a bunch of very broad questions, James. Sure, shoot. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Having worked at Apple, you you will be familiar with this, right? The, the Steve Jobs and Henry for the idea about, you know, people don't know what they want until you show it to them, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you think of this in terms of your process of doing design? And, and especially, I think, one of the things, a, a more specific version of this question will be, you know, things like when you are getting user feedback almost at every stage of development, how do you, you know, prevent some firmly ingrained practices, practices creeping into your design, especially when you're designing something novel? Yeah, so um, there's, there's different ways of doing this, but for, for one, you are correct. Jobs and Ford basically said that people don't know what they want until you show them, because ultimately, if you ask people what they want, then 
it's going to end up <laughs> it's going to end up being something that they they think that they want and you end up like Homer's car from the Simpsons because it just looks horrific and um the, the best way to mitigate against this is to build something using best practice first so if you if you just go out and ask people what they want you're going to the problem with especially in medical systems is that like I said earlier you're going to end up with that personalization issue where actually there's 90 different versions of what everybody wants and you can't build 90 different versions of an application. You need to keep it small and simple. And, um, so you utilize design best practice uh, and maybe feedback from you know observations that you've done or surveys or whatever it might be and build a prototype and then get feedback on that prototype because then you get far more specific feedback in terms of things that you've built and you don't have to worry about or things that you haven't built because that can come later on. You can add things later on. The other thing that we, we do as well in terms of things like creeping in is we, we just follow an agile software development approach, which is only look at prioritize things. So you can have a list of 900 things that you want in the app, but realistically, you're only going to work on the top six. And then maybe the seventh and then the eighth and then the ninth. And then you're probably never going to get to the 900 thing, but it was probably only one person that wanted it in the first place anyway. So um so yeah, you, we do the agile approach, which basically means that you you look at the the the, the most prominent things that the app requires. Uh, in terms of the clinical guidelines, it was a good menu system that accessed um, you know guidelines that were designed in a usable way so that clinicians could treat patients. And then we looked at the decision algorithms, and then how warnings should be displayed, and then how calculation tools should be displayed, and then we only got feedback on those things. And not whether somebody wanted a particular, you know, French author to be cited at the bottom of a guideline or whatever it might be. So that's that's kind of how we how we did it in that way. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's thanks. James Barry has asked a question in the chat. And then if there's time, I would ask after James that um how much of this is or how much of your work is applicable to patient-facing apps and things like that. Sorry, Ian, what was that one again? Sorry. How much of this is applicable in general to patient-facing applications and tools and helping them with their patient side of CDS? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking at a patient version of, of this um, that is simplified uh, in terms of, you know, reducing um, clinical language, for example. Um, and it's almost the same as like the student version as well. Like the student version needs to be expanded for learning the patient needed a version needs to be changed for simplicity, um, but allowing them to have access to uh, similar clinical workflows that the clinicians have so that they understand what's happening to them. And then the clinician can utilize that um, in terms of building conversation and trust and rapport and whatever it might be as well. Oh. So um, we are looking at it, but it's um, it's a long, hard slog, I imagine, because Getting access to clinicians is one thing, but patients, on the other hand, <laughs> is another yep. level altogether, especially in the UK. Yep. Um, yeah, so that, um, yeah, so uh, uh, James mentioned about uh, needs to be a mechanism to allow feedback um, if the physician felt like they had to operate outside the guidelines. Um, so there's two things that I always say on this. One, uh, within the app itself, there is a feedback button that the clinicians can feed back to. That goes back to the original author of the guideline and also the software developers as well. Um, but the second thing is, and I think most clinicians will probably agree in terms of guidelines, is that uh, there's a saying that they're guidelines, not tram lines, and that you will find that there are clinicians that that look at the guidelines and disagree with them, whether that be from experience, more modern research papers that haven't been integrated yet, um, or that actually, you know, it's just their clinical decision. Um, these are guidelines for clinicians to utilize in supporting a decision that they're making. So it's not necessarily a tram line to say, this is what you have to do. This is the guideline in terms of the literature. And then you make that decision and, you know, you, you it's on the it's on the clinician to make that decision. Yeah, and that uh, not, not on the guideline. important if you're developing clinical pathways or or an app like this because it's something that allows you to constantly learn and make your pathway or, or app better yeah. over time. So that mechanism is certainly necessary. So we've got two feedback set, uh, sections. One is for the guideline information itself. The second is for the, the app itself. Um, and then also um, where anytime we make any changes, we go through the same user-centered design process, getting feedback, testing it with a smaller group, 
um and then and then obviously implementing it wider as well so hopefully there we go any more questions are we good thank you marvelous thank you very much in that case and thank you for li listening to me waffle on about it for an hour so i will uh, i will speak to you all soon james thanks, thanks for for coming and doing this um it was really great and no um, thanks for inviting me thanks for coming everyone thanks guys